What's going on, Katie, Texas? Welcome to episode 94 of season six of Talking Throws Podcast, uh, Texas style. I'm Coach Jason. And we are Throws Coaches with the Track Club, The Thorn Factory. You can go to that website, thethornfactory.com. Right now, guys, we are in the heat of the summer, or excuse me, of the school season, getting ready for summer track. Um, having a lot of calls asking about summer track. If you have questions about joining a team, joining a throwing team, if we specialize in any of the five implements, just go to the thornfactory.com website and you can find our contact information, our cell phones, or our email address. Um, If we're not in your area, we have Coach Jarvis West at the Thorn Factory, excuse me, East at the Thorn Factory, and Coach I. Smith um, West at the Thorn Factory, and then Coach Knight out in Abilene. Uh, running night uh, performance, night power and performance. Also, if you have a young one, summer track season is around the corner. You've got a little kid who needs to stay active and needs something to get involved in. It's not quite sprinter um, or runner. Reach out to us. You can throw the javelin, um, shot put as young as eight years old, right? Yes. Javelin even younger. Okay, to find a place to plug in and somewhere to keep those kiddos busy. They'll be hot and tired back after the day of the track. For sure. So reach out to us. We'd like to thank our sponsors for season six, Texas Track and Field Coach Association. That website is ttfca.org, ttfca.org. Um, there's information about the media champions coming up at Texas State University at the end, middle of May. Um, also, too, if you go to fourthrows.com, if you're looking for quality information price right, use the code Talking Throws Ten to get ten percent off. Yeah, um, I got the bag. Got the bag. The five or four and, bag. And the discus. So, um, five or sports discus a way new new way to get the discus. You can go to five sports.com. That's a new one right there. Okay, and use the code Talking Throws Ten on uh, fourthrows.com. To get your fiber sports discus, or you can go to the thornfactory.com and hit the link below, and that will take you to the site to get the discus as well. For the circle, making throwing more accessible, use the code Talking Throws 10. Um, I had a lot of discussions with a lot of people who don't have throwing rings at their schools um, for whatever reason, and a lot of times, too, with these new football fields coming in and construction happening and building dirt. For whatever reason, they knock down the throwing area or, or put, stack stuff on the cement. So anyway, if that's your situation, we're sorry. We're sorry, but a port of circle is a great alternative for your kids still to get the reps in. It might be in a gym or a hallway or a kid who's overachiever who wants one for his home. Go to portofcircle.com. Use the code Talking Throws Ten. Uh, if you're looking for personal training in the greater Austin area, Ready Up Athletic Development let, ran by Zach Phillips. Zach has developed a program called Basic Throw Strength. Uh, the program is called Basic Throw Strength. It is a program designed for multi-sport athletes who are going in from basketball, volleyball, football, into track and field. And you can find that program on trainheroic.com. Trainheroic.com. Again, the program is called Basic Throw Strength. If you use our code THROWS10, you're going to get 20% off the program. And then finally, too, we have that YouTube channel. Please go subscribe and give us the thumbs up. Um, You don't have to watch it if you don't want to, but uh, we're really trying to push the YouTube channel. And so far, the responses have been good. If you don't like it, give us a a thumbs down or make us a comment about that. So, and then today's guest on episode 94 is currently a sports psychologist consultant uh, part-time for the University of St. Thomas. She is running her own business off a website called presentmomentmindset.com, presentmomentmindset.com. And she has a degree in applied sports and performance psychology. Uh, Also, she has worked with Rice University Women's Cross Country. Uh, She works for University of St. Thomas, track, volleyball, dance, and their esports. She has worked with high schools in the greater Houston area, from St. John's High School to Katie Tompkins to Westbury Christian. She's also worked with uh, professional athletes as well. Currently, she works with the UPSL men's soccer team, Revision. Uh, She is a graduate of West Orange Stark High School in Orange, Texas. She's also a graduate of Texas A&M University 
in 1989. She's Please welcome to the podcast, episode 94, Michelle Gregovich. Hello. Hello. Oh, hey. Nice to meet you guys. And, and, yeah, go uh, for it. And see what happens. So Janelle will start us off and um, we'll go. Well, first off, how do you pronounce your last name? Oh, there you go. Oh, good one. Gregovich. Okay, I was okay. right. Yes. Right, yes. Always argue about how to pronounce. Uh, yes. Name. No, you're good. My husband is from uh, Serbia, Montenegro. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. So so I I have an easy last name. I was Miller, but I I, I inherited this <laughs> this really difficult. Gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> All right. You did great. Gotcha. I would have been right. All right. And also the first question is how can my wife do a better job of loving me? Can you talk to her? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. We're going to get into that. We'll get into that. Bonus, okay, the good. bonus content. This is like bonus Dr. Field. <laughs> bonus content. We may have She to... needs to love me as much as I love myself. How does she do that? <laughs> I love that. Follow his lead, I guess. <laughs> That's a whole other <laughs> story. You and me, Janelle. You and me. Yeah, there we go. We'll talk later. We'll yeah, talk we'll, later. Talk. <laughs> we'll talk. For sure. <laughs> We are so thankful for having you on and like I said, just kind of completing that circle because we have so yeah. many um, kids who throw and all that and how mm -hmm. mindset is such a huge part of it. So let's go back a little bit. Tell us a little bit about your background and how you sure. even got started in this. Yeah, well, I'll share with you a little bit of my story because it's, um, it's you know, I, I kind of, I was like, I was telling Jason, I think I feel like I came around, you know, kind of back doorway, you know, life kind of leads you there sometimes, but you know, I was, um, as I was actually in performing arts whenever I was in school for many years, was in performing arts in both music, uh, um, played the flute, piano, and theater. And so, and I was kind of this kid that was involved in like everything and, you know, head of everything and whatever and everything, academic overachiever, I guess you could say, and pretty much everything. And um, so that might have been where I was headed, but whenever I went off to college and I went to Aggie Land, so I was an Aggie. And, uh, but, you know, right, you know, there were, there were certainly difficulties in high school, but whenever I went to um, school as a freshman, my parents started to get a divorce that same year and, you know, kind of turned things a little bit upside down. And then short, a few months after that, my father got cancer. So kind of middle of that. And then literally within a year, then he passed away. So, you know, that, you know, it was kind of colored my, co my college career in a very, you know, kind of turned it some very different ways. So rather than being kind of the outgoing, really um, overachiever that I had been, I, you know, college just became a time when I really found myself kind of shutting down and experiencing a lot of difficulties and kind of, you know, just withdrew from most everything. I wasn't involved in anything and um, I was just dealing with a lot of stress. And what really was the case was I was, I was kind of, I think, reassessing a little bit of how I was approaching life. You know, I was having a lot of stress issues um, health-wise and, you know, with with stomach issues. And I was, I was involved with people with a lot of, um, as, as sometimes happens in college, I was around some other girls that were in, into some eating behavioral disorders, you know, binging and purging and um, calorie restriction and over exercising. So this particular time in my life, these things I was also surrounded by that also influenced me. And I kind of became involved in that as well and um, didn't treat myself very well through high school. I mean, through college. So um, after my dad had passed away, and so what happened, I, I um, went, ended up going overseas to study, which was good. I had to make some kind of shift to just um, change my major, kind of felt, felt like a big change for me. But when I came back, I was still dealing with these, um, I guess, maladaptive ways of dealing with stress, and I ended up getting very sick. And um, I had some heart, heart issue at my last year of college, and so I ended up having to just withdraw from everything withdraw from school. And um, I, I couldn't even, I didn't even have the strength to walk across the house. I, you know, I just couldn't do anything. And this is so unusual for me because like I said, I was someone who was always going very, very, always athletic, running, participating in everything, but suddenly I couldn't do anything. And everything that I was, you know, had in my life, I had to stop. And I always say, you know, I would say, oh, I was kind of fortunate in hindsight, I was fortunate that when I was young, I had this opportunity to kind of shift the way I was approaching life um, that maybe I hadn't planned for. But 
as I got older, I kind of reinterpreted that. I was like, I think I just needed a lot more time to get it. So that's why I had to have this happen early because I'm kind of a slow learner. So, so after I was able to come back and finally finish school, I kind of, um, I, I did have an understanding in some way that my body was giving me a message. And that was that whatever I was doing to it wasn't working. That the way I was thinking about myself, the way I was treating myself, the way I was using things like exercise and stuff was not in a way that was helping me. Instead, it was hurting me. So I, I had that kind of beginner understanding that this just wasn't working and the direction I was going was really not working and my body wasn't going to let me go that way anymore. So it took a number of years for me to kind of rebuild really my strength. And I ended up just falling into a yoga class. Um, and at that time that I'll, I'll age myself, but you know, no one really knew what yoga was in Houston. There were no, like, I think there was a studio somewhere, but there, you know, no one really knew anything. And so when I went in, like literally we didn't, didn't even have yoga mats. I always tell people that and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm like, it really wasn't that long ago, but believe it or not, we didn't have Lululemon. Lululemon. <laughs> we didn't have Lululemon and we didn't have yoga mats. <laughs> So it was like, I don't know what I was doing. I was just kind of being led. I felt like to walked into something and something kind of stuck in that I felt different after I left. I, I felt a little bit of shift um, and I, it felt a little better, but it was very disturbing at the same time. You know, when they asked us to sit still and they asked us to meditate, even if it was only for like one minute, it was so disturbing to me. It was so stressful. I couldn't even take that like 60 seconds of sitting there um, being still and being with my own thoughts. I found that excruciating. Mm -hmm. And people wouldn't believe that now, but I'm like, I promise I'm you. I'm now with yoga, but. <laughs> yeah, so I was like, there is hope because I literally couldn't do it. I couldn't sit. I would just roll up my mat and leave, roll up my towel and leave. Right. But I, I but something stuck with me, like there's something different about this. And and really what I was finding was there was something different about the way I was thinking about myself, like something different about thinking of is what I'm doing helping me or hurting me. So I had this kind of shift to start thinking differently and reinterpreting what I was feeling like this discomfort I was feeling. Was it bad discomfort that I needed to run away from or was it something I could sit with a little bit longer? Right. And I'm sharing that because that's a, like really at the heart of a lot. What I share with athletes now is like we have to be comfortable with what's uncomfortable when we know it might take us to where we're trying to get. Right. And so I so I slowly as, as life goes, you know, wanted to pursue that. I became a teacher pretty quickly and I was teaching and I was teaching, you know, workshops and teaching other teachers and, and just getting more into understanding the way the body worked. I was fascinated with both the mind and the body. So I became more educated in movement and biomechanics and fascia and injury prevention and began going in these directions of, of working with um, every population imaginable. I just ate up everything I had really. So I'm, I'm someone as I've, I've worked with you know, little kids in kindergarten up to professional athletes, up to, you know, seniors and active older adults. I, I'll work with anybody, right? And I would just try to share whatever I learned. And and I think I was fortunate that I, you know, wasn't picky. I took anything because it really allowed me to learn about people more than just one kind of people. It's just people, like what we go through, how we're different, how we age, you know, different goals at different times in our lives, different developmental stages. And I just really learned both from studying, but also just this really experiential learning of just putting myself out there and um, getting to know people. And I would say what I really learned was that I love people. Like I love being around people. I love learning about people. I love, you know, hearing their stories and just, you know, really kind of um, learned a lot about what makes people tick. So both with working with like uh, like I said, a lot of athletes and working with a lot of particularly runners, soccer players, and tennis players were a few populations I worked with quite a bit. Um, just, you know, worked with a lot of them, but also would learn even, you know, older adults. What do they deal with whenever they want to stay active, right? So we learned about chronic I issues, chronic injuries from overuse from when we're young. So you kind of learn all these things, right? And then also chronic stress, um, people dealing with pain, you know, from injuries and stress. So I just kind of like my bucket just kept getting fuller and fuller. And um, and I have enjoyed, you know, 
25 years of working with all of these populations and teaching teachers and sharing it. And, you know, and then I'm kind of a pandemic baby, like I think you shared where, where, where the pandemic kind of shifted people and you know, made you kind of choose things a little differently. And so for me, I had just um, signed a lease with a, a studio that I was going to partner with. And then the month later, a pandemic started, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> and look, the studio had to shut down. Like we couldn't keep it going. So, you know, things shifted and I had to question what I really, really wanted to invest my time in. And yeah. I really wanted to dive deeper into that mental side. And I really wanted to do it with a population that I had, you know, the people I had really enjoyed working with. And I think what I've always enjoyed is people that um, are like, I love working with young people and I love working with um, people that really have um, goals and really are after achieving kind of their, you know, making the best of themselves, just wanting to know themselves on a, on a more, you know, bigger level and find their optimal potential. And, you know, that's, that's really what, what fires up my engines. And um, so I went back to school and kind of dove deeper into the sports psychology, sport and performance psychology. And, you know, and, and honestly, again, I'm not always sure I knew what I was doing. I just kind of follow what seems like the right thing at the time. You know, I just like dive in and I absolutely loved everything. And because um, I wasn't sure how I would fit in coming from the background I have you know, and um, how that would fit. But I just felt like this needed, what I understood and what I had practiced needed to be shared with a much broader population than just like in a studio format or something like, like it's just so beneficial. And between just diving into the, into the research and doing my own research and then learning, you know, getting more experience and working with um, Len, Dr. Lenny Waite, who's there at the head of the program, who I'm now working with at UST. I mean, I've just kind of, you know, really loved every moment of it. And so that's kind of how I got here. Now I am working at UST, University of St. Thomas with Dr. Lenny Waite, who heads the program. I support the students there. I mentor them and supervise them and help with some of the, pro you know, help to just make the program, you know, run and, um, and, and also have my own consulting business and work with teams and um, around and individuals and, you know, just really loving it every moment of it. <laughs> now what's, what's your website? What's that called? Uh, present moment mindset. Okay. Present moment mindset.com. And I sat with that a long time and just what I want to call it. Cause I had to shift one. And I was just like, that just came to me one day. And I was like, that is really where I'm trying. That's where I'm always trying to be is how can I really be more in the present moment? Right. And if my if I can do that, it's not about blocking things out. It's just about being able to bring my attention to what's in front of me a hundred percent. And if I can do that, you know, I can find peace and bliss, or I can also perform at my highest level. Like it's really a universal kind of idea. Gotcha. Gotcha. I, mean, I, I love that story. You just came all around <laughs> to and you went wherever you felt like you were led to go. And <laughs> pandemic said, hey, this is where jump into sports stuff yeah, and yep. yeah. yeah for sure oh, that's awesome. so in college did, I, I, a quick question did you go to any of the Aggie football games while you were oh, there absolutely okay. absolutely yes right. I was just I was just curious if you were just a fan fan of sports in general during your youth and just so just curious yeah no I I love that and I you know I did the core thing and had my date from the core and oh, you know my flung my 12th man towel and you know, all that good stuff. Absolutely. Did you dunk, did you dunk your ring? I have to ask, but you don't have to answer that. Yeah. Do I have to answer that? Is my mom going to watch this? No, no. <laughs> no oh, I absolutely. There's a picture somewhere. So don't worry. Picture. Okay. I'll picture it. So, for, so for our audience, all the coaches, all the athletes listening, can you explain to us what sports psychology is? Yeah, absolutely. Really good question. Um, I think I spend a lot of time just trying to help educate people on what it is. And, and what it isn't, right? But, I, and I really, I start by saying like, you know, what does that feel like whenever you are, can you imagine, I'm sitting with some athletes, can you imagine that uh, one of those moments where you're just out there doing what you love and like everything's clicking, right? All engines go and you're just feeling good. And I might ask you to close your eyes and think about one of those times when um, you just feel like you're unstoppable. And ask them like, what does that feel like, right? And they'll say things like it feels light or it feels easy 
or it feels, you know, free, or it feels like I'm on fire. Or someone else will say, I feel calm. And I'm like, yeah, it's like all these things, right? Like when we're really at our best, we're just like feeling this lightness and this ease, but at the same time, very strong and on. And I'm like, well, if you know that's in you, then why would you show up to one performance and it's just like that? And the next time you go, it's, it's not, right? Have you ever had a time where it just doesn't show up, right? You know, you know it. You've been there, you felt it, you practice it every day and like you feel it and then you go and where is it, right? It's not there. And I say, what, what's the difference, right? What's the, like, did you have some, you know, something happen or did someone give you some kind of pill or something during the week and it just, you lost everything. It's like, what's the difference, you know? And so we come to understanding that the difference between like practice and performance is that element of pressure right? So that pressure that comes to us that we're dealing with. And that pressure can be like a really, you know, um, tangible pressure. Like we've got, we've got to make this, um, we've got to, in, in track and field is a really good example, because you've got so many unique elements of being in this sport. And that's like, I know I'm working with a high school track team and Tuesday is district. And it's what they do on that day, not what they did the whole time and they've like had this great season and proved themselves over it's what they do on that day and last two track practice I've been to it's been like crazy weather like wind blowing like crazy it was cold I mean you don't know what's going to show up right and yet you have to perform so there is can be this very tangible pressure of, of this immediacy of what you've got to do but it can also be this pressure of like you know expectations what what are my friends going to think what am I going to post on social media if I, what are they going to say about me? You know, what are my parents going to say? So we have these other expectations or, or I just, you know, I have to be good. I have to be good. And so this pressure is that difference. And that pressure is not that physical element, it's the mental element, mm -hmm. right? And so we say, you know, there's also the saying that like sport is like 95% mental and 5% physical. Sometimes you hear these kind of things. And then I try to, you know, retort back to them, like, really? I don't think that's the case because I can't go out there and do what you're doing. If you look at like, you know, no matter how much I might know, I can't like, it's, it's physical. Okay. Let's be real about it. Like it's 95% physical. You've got to put in the time. You've got to put in the effort. You've got to have some kind of skill. You've got to be able to develop that strength. I mean, it's got to be there, but the 5% is really kind of like the key. And I'll say like, it's like the key in the, in the ignition, but then I have to go, well, like, I don't put the key in the ignition anymore. Yeah. Right. So I'm like, <laughs> it's the app on your phone yeah. <laughs> that turns the car on. So it's, but it's kind of that, that igniting factor. And if it's not working, it doesn't matter how good your engine is, it's not going to fire. Right. So it's a key element, but it has to be supported by all the other stuff uh, that you do. So that's kind of support psychology gets into that. How do you develop that consistency? How do you help yourself take all the training you're doing and then be able to focus it on the right moment um, whenever you need it? So we say sports psychology or, or a perfect uh, optimal mindset would be about being able to put your attention where you want it, when you want it there every single time, right? How do I do that? Yeah, that's kind of where we get into. So wow. as, a, as a consultant in, in, you know, say a young high school, athlete reaches out to you or the parents reach you how do you approach your angle you know because they if they are a high achiever and they're maybe not be goal oriented as they should be and mom and dad's kind of frustrated how do you do that assessment to say okay this is kind of where I start does that make sense mm -hmm. you're coming in after the fact yeah like they've already got yeah. their practice they've already you know, had some uh, attempts at success, maybe they've even had some success and then suddenly maybe something's happened. Yeah, they've now made the A team instead of the B team, right? Yeah, so nobody's going to come to you from the beginning and go, I'm going to be a varsity football player, but I'm on B team right now. Get me there. <laughs> right, right. It's always something's wrong. I need right. you to help me. <laughs> right, right. So they're panicking. You know, they just made, I had one girl I was working with and she just moved up to the higher AAU team in, in basketball, right? And was doing you know, great on the other one, but now in that higher level, then suddenly things aren't clicking, you know, and that pressure has risen. And then now the trouble's setting in. So it's like, okay, can you fix her? <laughs> and then also, 
So we're like, okay, so really the first thing I think is so important um, with every athlete, I think is, is to just develop a rapport with them and, and just let them start to tell their story, right? A lot of times just by being heard and really being able to, to ex explain or, or talk about and help them develop words to explain what they're feeling and help them be able to articulate that. Some, you know, some kids, especially we're dealing with young kids, but everybody, some people are better at being able to explain what's in there, what they're thinking and what they're feeling. And some people are not so good at that, right? Yeah. So just giving them a space to kind of work with that a little bit instead of having to perform, you know, coaches out there, like I want you to perform today or game is out there who wants you to perform. And of course a coach has to be like everything, like coach and he has to be a psychologist and he has to be like tutor and he has to be time manager, like everything, right? So they, they just don't have, you know, an infinite amounts of time to sit there so but the first thing I do is like hey let's just talk about you and what makes you tick like if they're already out there they're already in that sport they're work, they're already working hard right they're already putting themselves on the line all the time they're intentionally choosing to put themselves in a situation where they are compared to other people all the time okay yeah right so, so let's give them a place where they're not having to compare themselves and they can just be real and step back and try to look at themselves a little like, what, what do I feel, right? What is working for me? And that's the first thing I want to talk to them about is like, what do they have already? What's in their pocket? You know, what are their strengths? What are they made of? Nice. Because that might not be exactly what's showing up in their numbers. Right. And that's probably, like you said, hard for some kids to say. Mm -hmm. what their strengths are and what they're good at because mm -hmm. you know hospital communication is a struggle but understanding yes. how to put those in words so do you just like sit and be patient and kind of <laughs> let them which is hard right to talk yeah. it out and not have to pull out of it and I'm assuming mom and dad are not in this first meeting or are they? that would be ideal I mean I, I always like invite parents if they feel they would like to be there and you know I, I never want anybody to feel there's something to hide because I don't think there is um, but, I, you know, that relationship is so important between the parent and the child, and there can be very unintentionally a lot of, you know, pressure coming from there. Um, the parent will say, well, I'm not putting any pressure on them. I just want them to do their best. And, you know, the child's like, and there's the pressure, you know, <laughs> but, you know, but I'm like, parents, you know, it's hard. I'm a parent. I have three kids. I know it is hard to see your child struggle. Mm -hmm. It's hard, especially when you know what they can do. If you know this child can do this, this or that. You've seen them. It's hard to watch them struggle. You just want to help them, you know? So I get that side too, I really do. And is, so, yeah. Is it, is, it, is it a duration thing? And I say that because, you know, you kind of come in after the fact. Is it, do you think of it as a six week, once a week meeting for six weeks? Or do you look at this as kind of, one step, one meeting at a time, and don't worry about the duration. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And I, I think it would be really nice if I could say, like, I've got a six-step program to, you know, and there's a lot out there, a lot of books and a lot of programs that would just, you know, and that that's really helpful. Um, but you, I think the most important thing is just like um, that I have to be flexible. Um, just like I'm, what am I teaching an athlete is to be really that psychological flexibility, their ability to adapt in different situations. So that's how I have to be as well, right? So with sports psychology, I think one thing that's really exciting about it that makes it um, unique and also very different than like traditional therapy, you know, psychotherapy mm -hmm. is that often that you're like, okay, let's come once a week and let's, you know, go until we're finished. And that's perfect. That's great. Go sit in an office and, you know, talk for your hour or 50 minutes and just, you know, keep going back and slowly picking at the iceberg and trying to get to those things. And that is so important, right? But the neat thing about sports psychology is it's really, you have to be nimble. So I have, um, I have athletes that, yeah, we're going to, we're going to meet. And usually what I say to an athlete, if I'm meeting one-on-one -on -one and, you know, like outside of the sport context, then I say, hey, let's meet and then let's meet at least twice close together. Like, let's meet. Let me get to know you. Let me get to kind of give you some thoughts on maybe how to approach something different. And then I want you to go out and I want you to try it and you just see what sticks. And then I want you to come back pretty soon. Right. So we can kind of reflect on that 
and just get your experience. And then from that, often I'm like, let's just see what's going to work for that person, right? I've had people that I can work with once or twice, and they're really just in a, at a bump and they need to reinterpret. They've suddenly had panic attacks. Um, I had someone that uh, suddenly, you know, had fallen or had something issue and just kind of started having panic attacks. And it was just really at a place, a high level where I was able to just really talk to him and help him understand that in a different way, give him some tools and fine, he's ready to go, done, right? But that depends on that child, that, that kid, that athlete. Yeah. Um, and others, we might need just more time. But then the other thing is we're not always in the, you know, in the clinical setting. We're certainly not always in my office or on the Zoom. We might, I'm, I'm on the side of the, the field. And that's, a, you know, I might get five minutes if I'm lucky. So a really? water break. And you got to try to help them out, right? So you got to be really flexible. How do you approach that in five minutes when, you know, you're kind of in the heat of the battle and you know chances are if they are talking to you something didn't go way go that right way in competition mm -hmm. you know how how do you handle that five minutes yeah it's, it's it's challenging that's part of what I love about it you know I really love the fact that like I was at a um a track a track practice last night or getting ready for a district you know and and so you is a sports psychology consultant you really just have to be there first of all you just have to show up you got to be there you got to get your eyes on the people who are, you know, the athletes of what, what, what does that feel like? What is that context they're in? What is that relationship with the coach? What does the pressure feel like in that particular situation? Um, how is everybody interacting? And so being able to just be there and observe already gives you a little bit of insight. So you kind of, you're not just like pulling it out of nowhere, right? You've got, you can kind of yeah. see some things that are going on. And then a coach may walk over and be like, hey, can you talk to this guy? Can you talk to this guy? You know, <laughs> like this guy is really, you know, my talk, can you just like, and, and then next thing you know, you've got to sit on the bench over somewhere and chat with him. Oh, wow. Now, and, do, you go back to, do you go back to the coach and said, hey, Johnny said you're an asshole. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you do that? Do you talk to the coach? <laughs> coach, can you stop being an asshole? <laughs> yeah, that would be nice too. Now, I mean, so in like a practice situation that I might get to be able to sit with them a little bit longer, but again, we're, we're just sitting on the side, you know, we yeah. just, again, just getting to them, giving them a chance to kind of flush out some things. Um, and that's confidential, you know, you've got to balance that line. I might tell the coach, yeah, we had a good conversation or something like that, but you know, it's, it has to be a confidential space, but if we're in the, uh, a, a competition and they pull me aside, then you're like, I don't, when they're in that space, I do not, the last thing I want to do is start making them think hard, right? Mm -hmm. Last thing you want an athlete do, doing is getting in his head or her yeah. head, right? You want them to stay in that space that feels like in the flow, it feels natural. It's what I've practiced. So in that kind of situation, that five minute break or whatever they have, you're trying to help them just usually kind of calm down, right? Maybe they're over nervous about something, something kind of maybe their race got delayed or they didn't do well on one event, but now they've got to go do another event. So you're just trying to help them reset. So you're trying to help them kind of check in, where are they? Uh, how can they kind of recognize that and recognize, you know, use something to help them calm down, get in that right space. And then what do they need to focus on and move forward? So you really don't want to take them too much out of that present moment. Wow. That moment. Oh, she's really good. Oh, I thought you had a question. No, I did. I'm just thinking of all the, all the great things. And, and so you've kind of related to that high school setting and stuff. I, I want to kind of change maybe the athlete, maybe that mm -hmm. professional athlete. Mm -hmm. And the professional athlete is getting paid, already had great success. Do you kind of approach both athletes the same or because of maturity, um, pocket value? <laughs> That you you kind of you you surely have to take a different angle. Kind of what walk us through how you approach maybe the professional athlete then. Yeah, sure, sure. And I work with a couple of um, professional track athletes, and um, and you know, in all honesty, with track athletes, there's there's not always the commensurate payment that there should be. Yeah, for the yeah. The pressure so, of not getting paid. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not you know, can't. It's a little different story than if I'm working with maybe an NBA athlete, right? Yeah. That's, going to be a whole different story the notoriety and all they're dealing with is a little bit different so thinking of more of the track field since that's you know what you guys are in and that's um who I'm thinking of as well yeah it is different you do approach them differently because they have first of all they have a different perspective 
And that's, that's one thing I always want them to know is like, you have perspective because you've been there, you've got a story behind you, right? And that story is you want to lean on, like, what have I learned? And why am I, why am I choosing this? And that's a question you always want to ask them, like, why are you choosing this, right? You could go hang up your shoes and, you know, get a, a behind the desk position. So you want them to really connect to their why, why is this important to me? And what do I want out of it? And who am I? Because as a professional athlete, now you're dealing with contracts. And are they going to want to keep me? And am I going to, you know, am I good enough for this? And what about my brand? You know, what are people thinking about me? I need to keep up that brand. So there's all this different pressure and then maybe the financial issues as well. So, you know, we may be talking about, you know, what we may be talking about relationships still with some of these, but even though, you know, they've got a big competition and you're watching them and think, you know, this is all about the sport, but they've got a life too, right? They're independent usually at that time yeah. and trying to negotiate being independent and transitioning from the support and structure of college. They've been an athlete in college. They've got this team support. They've got this structure that someone's getting them every day and just, it feels safe. And then they're in a place that might feel more competitive individually for contracts and such. And so you've, you've got to help them work with that pressure as well and stay focused. Yeah, yeah. So for a lot of these sessions, is you feel like it's important for some, like I'm going to go back to high school kids because that's what we work with, just to be heard. Like for a lot of it, when they just start talking, they get to the root of where it's at and they just need someone to stop and listen to them. Is that, they kind of, I don't want to say okay. fix themselves, but no one ever lets them stop enough and listen to yeah. it, 15, 16 year old, right? And yeah. lets them really talk. Is that kind of your experience with the, sometimes so I mean sometimes right some people and like you said some people talk more than others sometimes you're just helping them find the words but sometimes it's the first time they've uh I often when an athlete you know let's say they've even started like a middle school they've started young well you know at that age it's different right in middle school like they'll still like be kind of geeky with you and just really kind of silly and whatever and then suddenly they're entering high school and now there's you know, just a heavier dose of this whole peer pressure who am I um, the competition starts to get tougher and then as they move up now we're thinking about college and depending on how competitive you know that is at their school they may have all this pressure of making all these decisions so that can be the first time they really encounter this just uh, they're not just constantly um, winning and increasing in their ranking and status. Suddenly they're realizing, okay, the people that I was beating so easily, well, they've dropped out of it by now. And now it's the serious ones that I'm with. Mm -hmm. So it, sometimes it can be the first time they've encountered just such feelings of self-doubt or feelings of nervous that have impacted their, their results. And so a lot of times just allowing us to kind of talk about it. Sometimes I, I have to help them find those words, but it just by recognizing, yeah, this is normal and feeling nervous is normal. And you just thinking that I'm just going to have one straight line from start to best, <laughs> that that's not how it works. And just sometimes helping them have a different perspective. Sometimes that does resolve things for them pretty quickly. Did, go ahead. Yeah, you go. Does that vary? <laughs> Because in track and field, it's a team sport. But as mm -hmm. we know, like throwing for shot and disc is very individual mm -hmm. versus, you know, the relays or even basketball and there being five people in the court or football, there being 11, mm -hmm. you know, so the pressure for success in my perspective might be more individualized for that thrower versus the left guard on that 11 man football team on offense, mm -hmm. you know, who is just a contributes to the other 11 on defense. Mm -hmm. well, and don't you even find that just to add another question to it, that you can have different personality types attracted to those different types of events, yeah. right? Even in track and field, you can have a totally different body type of personality type that's there running sprints versus the one maybe doing shot put or doing throw, yeah. right? So you have these different people as well. And that changes their, their perspective. So you might have some of, um, who um, like the, those individual sports because maybe they're sometimes more introverted. They like to, maybe they're more thoughtful, you know, more analytical and they like that time and that slower processing. 
And but at the same time, that's tough, right? You're in the throwing field where you're having to sit there literally and do your best and then stand there and think about it and watch the other person throw better than you. And then wonder you if you can do it. on that. <laughs> 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 help us can you what do we do <laughs> it's tough right yes we focused at such a slow pace like that yes. so and that's, and that's something we tell our kids it's they're out there in competition for 60 minutes mm -hmm. but in reality they get six minutes of of throwing maybe not mm -hmm. even and, six minutes well but each is a minute yeah. yeah but then so the other 54 minutes is just kind of left in your thoughts yeah. And a lot of times the difference between winning and losing in my perspective and how we coach is what you're doing in those 54 minutes mm -hmm. that you might not be throwing for the six that you are. If you know what I'm saying? And, and exactly. How to that. Yeah, exactly. So I was saying sometimes I'll say like, you can't be in control of your performance until you can be in control of yourself. Hi, my name is Meredith McGee and my father is the founder of Porta Circle. We created Porta Circle in order to make throwing more accessible so that you can truly train anywhere. Growing up in Rochester, while there was often a roadblock toward training, and having the Porta Circle was a lifesaver for both the indoor and outdoor season. Circles start at $149 and go to our website to learn more. www.porta-circle.com Porta Circle, making training convenient. Oh, you have to ask them, you know, it's like, what are you doing? What's happening in between? First, you have to find out how is this person responding to stress? Because we're all different, right? Someone might be um, getting in their head and they're worrying and they're meta worrying, which means I'm worrying about worrying, you know? Yeah. Oh my gosh, I'm such a worrier. How terrible. And, you know, and then somebody else may be feeling nauseous or maybe their shoulders are tensing up or, you know, they're feeling their heart, their palms sweating and things like that. So we all respond differently. So it's important to, to figure out how you respond to stress. And so then you can choose things that help you with the way you respond, right? So if someone tends to have this like tension, maybe their back tightens up, you know, especially as like you been working out, you know, doing this training for a long time, you have a lot of sore backs, right? So maybe mm -hmm. they can find under stress, maybe their back tightens up. So we definitely need to incorporate some kind of somatic or physical relaxation exercises that they can do on the spot with breathing, with kind of walking themselves through some progressive muscle relaxation, not like going to bed relaxation, that's important at bedtime, but just releasing that excess tension that might make them um, tighten up in the- You got an example of that? Sure. Like for instance, then we, again, that's a really good one to work on a little bit separate from the competition. So they can start to learn that something yeah. learned a little slower, but basically, well, for instance, breathing, breathing is so important. Like we do it like what, 10,000 times a day, but how many times do we do it consciously? You know what I mean? Right. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> by looking at our breath, by noticing, simply becoming an observer of the breath, we can art, I call it a mirror and a map. So by just observing the breath, we can see where we are stress-wise. Because as you watch your breath, you'll notice when it's relaxed, is this my relaxed breath or is this a tense breath? Is this relaxed down in my belly, down here in the rib cage, or is this kind of up here in my shoulders, right? Does it feel tight and easy or does it feel long and smooth? And I use a lot of adjectives as opposed to trying to, again, think about it, right? Yeah. Does it feel tight and easy? Does it feel slow and smooth? Does it feel easy? Does it feel hard? You know, and you can say, okay, hmm, I must be pretty feeling pretty stressed right now. Look at look at how my breathing is, right? Um, and then I can simply use some very simple breathing to help bring my my state back down, to calm that anxiety a little bit. Okay. Right? I want to find calm, and I always say the first thing we have to find. If I think of it like, um, I like this, I like this metaphor of a red light, yellow light, green light. And this is really helpful just in the moment because it's quick. We need quick mm -hmm. things. So I can think, okay, where am I? Am I at green light, yellow light, or red light, right? Red light would be like, I, I can't even go anymore. I'm so tight. My back's so tense. Like my, I'm having a panic attack, right? So we don't want to get there. So let's assume most of the time you're going to be green light or yellow light. And so if you ask yourself, where am I, right? Am I at green light or yellow light? If you're at green light, right? I'm relaxed. My breath is good. My body's relaxed. Okay, I know I can go. I can just turn on 100%. If I can sense that I'm kind of a yellow light, okay, I need to have something to kind of check in. I need to have something to, to refocus and reset and then move forward, 
So I'd be okay. So can I notice my next breath, right? I can be standing anywhere. I'm standing between um, throws, right? Can I just notice my breath for a moment? Where is it? Feels a little tight. Okay, can I do the inhale? The inhale a little bit more. And then I think of it like breathing on a candle. Have you ever tried like a, a little birthday candle, but you don't yeah. want to blow the candle out? If I was blowing it out, it would be like, okay, that's not a great exhale. But if I just want to breathe on the candle in a way that flickers the flame without blowing it out, we can try that, right? You'd inhale. And then just a very small, steady stream. Nice. Right? And that gives, if you use things like that, like images that you can focus on, it gets your attention a little calmer and it helps you engage a long, slow exhale. And that then I would say while you're exhaling, you're going to imagine your shoulders relaxing, your jaw relaxing, and your eyes relaxing. And I usually pick those three because they're they're always going to tense up when you're under stress, right? And they're, they're only three, so it's quick. And they're the things that tend to um, cause tension in our breathing and our attention. So shoulders and neck gonna cause me to tighten up in my breathing, right? Jaw and eyes gonna cause me to tighten up in my face, which is gonna cause my attention to narrow. And now I can't like take in the big picture. So three, three, three points, nice big inhale, slow exhale, maybe a few times. Shoulders, jaw, and eyes. That's what, like something I might teach them. Oh, wow. Yeah, and that's something. Well, I love that. Shoulders, really easy. And then a coach can also do that because then you can learn that same cue and you can do the same thing with your team. And, and now while you're sitting here talking, because this, this is something we use all the time. And I don't, it is just almost slang and you never think the kids really understand that in kind of the heat of the moment, we, we're, it's fast and we're rushing and we're trying to motivate them. But at the same time too, we say, just relax, just relax, just relax. <laughs> they don't know what that means. And, and, yeah. and, 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 They've never and, done it. And, and they're, but they're relaxed is, okay, I'm relaxed. All right, I'm gonna pick up the shot put. It's gonna go 30 feet. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm. you said relax. Well, you didn't throw 15 feet from your PR. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I, yeah, I wanted you to relax, but I still wanted you to compete. So my question is, is how do they, how do you relax, but you still activate your fight or flight yeah. to go kick somebody's butt? Good question. And, Good and question. Because I don't think kids, they don't understand, they don't know how to do that. They don't know how to flip that. I'm happy medium. Yeah, happy medium. I don't flip yes. the switch, a poor analogy, but you know what the road I'm going down. Yes. So yes, so I think of it again as um, I, I like to use, especially with, with kids, with anyone, right? Our mind really doesn't, isn't, our body is not really a, a body of a word language, right? We're more a body of like, we respond more to images, to sensations, like that's how, that's what helps us. Um, like if I tell you to think about being on a beach, what kind of feelings would you associate with being on a beach? Yeah. Okay. You, re you know, relax, you're calm, calm, fun. Relax when uh, she said that. I think right? I'm like Speedo. <laughs> yeah, but so I wouldn't have to tell you anything else. You're going to have something associated with that. And yeah. so, so we try to use images. Like I even ask them to think about like, what kind of um, energy do you want to be when you're ready for competition, right? So we use, I try to really choose words carefully. So instead of saying re relax, usually I say to be loose. You want to be loose and ready loose and ready or calm and clear, you know? So it's the right words that are, that are associated with the right feeling. So if I'm loose, it's about like, if I wanna go running or I wanna throw, I need everything to flow, right? I need to be loose, yeah. right? But not relaxed. So I kind of don't right. use that word as much there. Um, use some more like loose and ready. This idea of being like alive and on and full of fire. Mm -hmm. So I might use that calming breath, right? Just to get them to relax. And then have them, you know, and then use uh, images like fire. When we think about firing up, you want to be, you know, want to be warm. We want to be energized. Maybe we want to think of being like a jaguar, right? Something that's like calm, focused, but ready to pounce, right? Courageous, fast. So I try to associate it with more like, what are these things we already know, what they feel like? And can we you think about how, what it is we want to bring to this, um, to this event? Yeah. It's right. You got something? 
Well, I'm, I don't know if it's a good time to ask it now, but so when you know, let me tie these two things together. So like when you first meet someone, like you give them clues and then you meet with them again. In that time, are you asking them to journal or write down? Do you suggest or, you know, text themselves, you know, try, journal on there and I'd be typing it in their notes, but to kind of document what they're feeling because between when they saw you and again, mm -hmm. you know, they've had whatever, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a breakup, a whatever, you know, mm -hmm. all the things that they're going to forget, even though it's important. So I guess my question is, do you encourage kids to journal and kind of write, keep track of how they're, how they're feeling in a competition? Um, that could be great. Like some people love journaling. Do y'all do travel, like a um, practice diaries? Do you do anything like that? Some of them? Not really. Um, no, we, we don't. Yeah. The thing that we run into is we have a broad range of kids all the way from 12 year old. Yeah. To 18, 19 year olds. And these kids, those 18, 19 year olds are trying to get D1 scholarships and the 12 year olds exactly. are just trying to, you know, learn the foundation and stay out of mama's hair for a couple yeah. of hours. So, and, and so, and some of those are going to journal and some of those are not. So my point is like journaling exactly, is great. Exactly. So will I suggest it? Absolutely. If that seems right, but will I expect it? Not necessarily. So I'm always assuming that you've got to work on little time and maybe not great adherence whenever they leave you. Right. And so you're just trying to give them something they can use. And same thing when you're working with them, that you want something simple that everybody can find some kind of connection to and maybe they can kind of make it their own, right? So they can use it. They can take it and use it. It needs to be something easy. So I try to, you know, just really I'm helping them check in, giving them tools to help them check in. What am I feeling today? You know, so those check-ins, like if you're at a practice, what am I feeling now? I had a um, team I was working with this morning and they have papers. They have them kind of fill out when they come in. Like, how are they feeling physically? Do they, how do they feel mentally? And then what is their intention for the day? And you know, what are they wanting to focus on? What, what do they know is important? And then what are they going to focus on today? So just kind of checking in, how do you feel? And what do you want to accomplish today? Or what do you want to bring to today? What kind of attitude, what kind of, you know, focus um, can help people get more connected to make more of that practice time. And, you know, and then you can practice that, that habit that can be practiced for competitions. Then where are you? How are you feeling? Can you help yourself get in that right zone like you said do we need to relax more do we need to energize more where are you right and so you can you can get where you need to be based on where you are and then how can i set my intention so that i'm actually practicing a little more control over what i can for the competition because there's a lot that i can't control yeah yeah how, how what's the what's the aspect in your perspective of of being too focused because can you be too focused to affect winning and losing because you have some kids in because of my background and some of the people that I've been around is you know get focused get your mind right get focused get focused and you you go out and you lose by 21 points or something like that focus. but you're focused <laughs> and you know and and nowadays you kind of have that the mediation of old school mentality with kind of that new age thinking as well kind of interacting I was just kind of knowing your perspective on that so I wonder if someone were to tell me that, like, what are they focusing on? Yeah. That is my question. Yeah. They're ultra focused. What are they focusing on? Is their focus on the right thing? Gotcha. What do you, what do you think in that case? Do you think they'd be? Yeah. I, I That's a good question. Because if you tell like our kids, right, get focused. They, yeah, it's not specific. It's kind of a broad. Mm -hmm. Or are they focused on being perfect? you know, so focused on, well, if I don't do well, then something's wrong. Are they focused on the right thing? And, you know, so ask what, what is it you want to be focused on, right? That, that you want to focus on the task. What, is, what do you know you need to do, right? Is there a routine you have to get ready? If you're going to throw something, how do you do that? What are the pieces? Can you um, kind of imagine yourself going through that? So instead of thinking about what your girlfriend just texted you or that girl you're interested in didn't text you or whatever it is, or the grade that didn't come out the way you wanted, right? Is your attention there or is your attention here? And here we're thinking of what is it I do? What is the routine I have? How do I get ready? How between throws, how does I get ready? How do I check in with my breath? Can I get loose? Can I imagine myself going through this movement? Can I, you know, repeat to myself what it is I want to happen now? You know, that maybe um, an, a statement that helps me affirm what I want to happen at this moment. Can I, you know, see myself 
just putting in the trash, whatever happened before we're done with that. You know, so these ideas of what am I focusing on? Am I focusing on helping myself get in that best state? Or am I focused on something like trying to be perfect or I don't know what, what everybody else is doing? Yeah. Oh, as she, as you're talking, I'm just <laughs> sitting here thinking, <laughs> both of us were high school and college athletes, you know. A, I was a better athlete. <laughs> several years ago. <laughs> and as I look back and I've been coaching before we even did this club, I've coached, he's coached, I'm a teacher, all that. And mm -hmm. I think nobody taught this back in our generation of being athletes. That we were the ones who just said, hey, focus, get out there, you know, just mm -hmm. get out there and do it. So helping to understand more of these kids now, mm -hmm. like it, it, it's different, right? It's a little mm -hmm. different. I When I first started coaching, I could yell at a kid and it was okay. And now mm -hmm. it's, yes, you can still yell, but understanding it's, is intricate the right word? A little more intricate thought thinking that they get. I, I don't know what the right word is to put on it, but I'm just yeah, saying. Yeah, that's it. You I know, I think. Goals as a coach right. to help meet their needs because of all the stuff. I'm kind of rambling, but <laughs> sorry. Right, that they think a little differently. Yes. Right? And they're, what, what were you thinking, Jason? Well, my, I was going to ask, how would you coach the coach? Mm, and what, yeah. what, as your role, what advice would you give that coach who's dealing with a track and field and you've got distance runners, throwers, and sprinters who are all three different mentalities? And as a coach, man, it's, it's frustrating when you have three different athletes and three different events kind of underachieving and you know they all can do better, but at the same time, you know, you're like, okay, come on, Johnny, you got to get going. All right, come on, Sarah. Let's get focused. Let's get focused. Come on, Jimmy. You got to toughen up, you know, and you're, you're at all these three different things. And I don't want to say you're over coaching, but as a sports psychologist, how do you coach the coach? What advice for the coach that's listening to this to say, hey, how do I handle my team? But then how do I handle the individuals among that team? Yeah, no, good, good question. I think we probably need a whole episode. For yeah, that. <laughs> I think it's such a good question. And like part of it's like, what, what is this? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, we really do marriage. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And we, I mean, I am so um, supportive of helping coaches because like I said, a job is just so, you know, it's just so much. It's like 10 jobs rolled into one. Yeah. Especially in track and field, just with all the different demands. And some schools don't have coaches for every event. And some schools yes. do. So yes. it really is tough. And so the first thing is, you know, what is the culture there? What kind of culture are you establishing? Can you establish, especially if you've got just, you have to do more. You've got to do maybe, you're not just, can, you're not just focused on one event. You've got to do more events. Um, can you establish a culture and maybe some common language? Like what is the language you'll have around success? What is the language you'll have around expectation? And what are you celebrating, right? So do we celebrate just the outcomes, right? We have a great meet, we celebrate. Of course, we want to celebrate when people win and when they do well. But what if someone were sitting to the side and watching, what are you celebrating as a team? So what we really want to celebrate is consistency, discipline, dependability, you know, attitude, these kind of things, right? That we really want from our athletes, not only that help, they, we know that that not only helps them, but we know that that's what helps the team. Because when we have that kind of culture, then we're going to, you know, that some of that, some of that's going to take care of itself, right? Because that's the culture they're in. That's what they're being raised in. So it's going to have influence. So what kind of culture, what do I celebrate? I want to celebrate excellent practice. So then instead of always looking at outcome, and I know coaches are judged on athlete outcome, but we have to for a minute take our mind, our eye off of that and look at um, how we're helping them put themselves in the best environment to do their best at a competition. And that's what we have a little more control over is influencing the environment that they make for themselves so they can go to competition and let it go and not think about it. So how do I, how do I put, how do I create a culture of excellent practice? And what that looks like, maybe with some rituals of how maybe we start practice. How do we break that transition from if it's school or whatever's before us to um, to start practice? Can we do that with some kind of like check in, some kind of like reset? I know one coach talked about like having everybody just lay on their back on the track. It's after school. They literally just like lay down. You've got like 
three or four minutes. I just want you to transition basically from school to track. I want you to let it all go. Whatever your problems are, we're going to let them just go. And we're going to bring our attention here. So um, I was I also call it habit stacking. And again, that's not my term, but like, we're not trying to add things. We want to take what you're already doing and just add more intention to it. Uh, so you are establishing that idea of what, what you want to see out there. And then maybe you have some cues, some, some kind of ways that, that again, are in your team culture. It might be the way you celebrate. Maybe it's the way people, a word y'all use or the way, uh, a word that is, that support, you know, some kind of team, a little slogan, uh, positive words that, you know, you know, like the Ted Lasso thing with believe up yeah. on the poster, you know, but everybody knows there what that means as long as you keep it, you know, fresh and use it. So that's one thing I would say is how can you just work with the whole environment and have this consistent practice and bring the focus on how they can learn to celebrate because this is what they're not hearing from their parents a lot of times or from outside is just um, what they can really celebrate, getting more consistent, you know, showing up on time if they've struggled with that, having that good attitude, supporting each other when they're down, you know, um, just committing if they've committed to something following through. Those things tend to build on themselves. That's so good. No, I didn't have a question. I just, I'm, I'm wanting to write like a million notes, but then I would be like this the whole time. I'm having to rewatch this. Yeah. Hopefully I get to, I have the recording time. <laughs> It's great. No, great tips. Of but doesn't that approach out. change too if you're on a team that's winning when mm -hmm. it's quote unquote versus the team that's losing or maybe underperforming as well? I don't think so. Okay. Um, I think it's the same. I think that's really what you're trying to teach them. What would the, you know, the UConn, the basketball that's won so many trophies, right? What would they say if they um, you know, the Houston Cougars were going, I'm going to keep it local because they didn't do well in March Madness, but at the end, but you know, the whole season, they would say, well, you've won, you've won. So don't you expect to just keep winning? And they're always like, we just take one game at a time. We focus on the fundamentals. We know what we do well. In other words, you always got to get your mindset back in that, um, in that mode that is present moment and not what you did. Cause that's in the trash. That's last week that win only lasts so long. Right. So I, I don't really think it changes that much. Uh, for that, I think it's almost more important. Gotcha. What do you what what? Because I'm a product of this. Because I had a coach who you know loved me tough, and a lot of coaches nowadays kind of take that tough love approach for their athletes. They're mm -hmm. hard on them. They push them hard, but that kid knows it's from a good place. Mm -hmm. Is that acceptable nowadays, or is that sometimes too much to the extreme? I mean. I personally, of course, it all depends on what that looks like, right? But I yeah. think it's perfectly. And, and there's that fine line. That's the reason I'm asking. Yeah, I think you know, I don't think that it's about being nice in the sense of like you know being everybody's best friend or always praising. I think what uh, kids really benefit, athletes really benefit from, is feedback that is you know helpful, like instructional feedback. Let me know what I need to do. Like really give me clear feedback and not over feedback. So we have sometimes feedback dependency where if you're always about like, great job, great job, great job every time, then they're, you know, they're always looking for that. They don't know how to make their own decisions about what needs to be done. So I think feedback is more effective when it can praise, again, those qualities that you want them to continue, like very selective in what you're choosing to praise, and then um, allow them to work it out. You know, allow them to practice great. reflection. What worked for you today? What didn't work? How do you think you need to adjust that? So the more you can put on them and be honest, like, yeah, that didn't feel good to me. You know, like, what do you think? You know, I mean, they, they know. And if you're consistent and the people know whenever it's, tr it's honest and you want the best for them, or if it's personal, if it's personal, of course, it should never be personal feedback. Yeah. You know, That's it should be point. helpful feedback. All right. So the third, the third elephant in the room is the parent. Yeah. And because you <laughs> yes. know, you're dealing with teenagers and yes. you and you have the coach dynamic, you have the the competition dynamic and the parents dynamic. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give parents of that who what two two scenarios that overachiever mm -hmm. kid who wants to go out and achieve and be successful and be that D1 athlete and not really being pushed by their parents or the opposite where that kid uh, is I don't really know what I want to do. I might want to go do this in college, but mom and dad are like, you're going to come out here and work outwork everybody, you know, 45 hours a week. And you're going to get that. And the kid's like, 
okay, I'm out here because I love it, but my mom and dad's making me out here too. <laughs> yeah. So, so am I talking to the kid and the coach or the parent in this? The instance? parent. The parent. Oh, the parent. Okay. <laughs> There's something different, you know, to, to allow that kid that same kind of feedback we talked about will really be good for them yeah. um, in the track. And for the parents, I think the biggest thing to to help them understand, and I, like I said, I know I've had three kids, um, you know, athletes and everything. So I get it. It's hard to see them struggle, but the value in, in allowing them to struggle and really trying to get a long picture, like if you want these great things for them, what, what are, what is going to help them get there, right? What is help going to help them succeed in college? What is going to help them get that um, scholarship? That's what they want or get that, you know, get the best that they can out of them going to be to allow them to struggle and make decisions and become very critical thinkers. So can we see that actually having some setbacks is what makes them stronger? Can we have a growth mindset for the parents? And can we recognize that um, that being able to pick themselves back up is probably is much stronger, much higher quality that somebody would look for than to just see someone who's just always perfect because that's not realistic. So to help them understand that the journey is not straight, journey is not straight up, that an athlete's journey typically has a lot of winds and turns. And that is that is what that is what makes it worthwhile. That's what makes it sustainable. So we talk a lot about sustainable paths, right? And how can they help them? They can help them by again, similar feedback. Like, can you give them, can you give them positive feedback and just give them a chance to come home from whatever they're doing and be able to turn off? I think that's a big one. Allow them to perform and then allow them to have space at home that is not. The pressure situation. A lot of them have a place at home where they can just be who they want, celebrate as a family, have fun, turn off, right? And give them a chance to start developing some kind of balance in their identity. Be another one, right? Good. Great answers. Ah, Great answers. So good. Now, I was going to ask, um, we were looking at your her website went away. Some of the books you had on there, I am a very, um, I love to read and I'm always looking, mm -hmm. reading Oh, everything about mindset and mm -hmm. habits, all the habit, but you said habit stacking. I've read a couple of the atomic habits books, all those yeah. different variety of things. Um, are these some books you would recommend to kids to read or coaches, athletes? I mean, out of, um, like I had heard, go back up the one do hard things. Yeah, that, that, those, that, that definitely, it depends how young they are okay. or how avid reader they are. They're ones, you know, I've read and, and ones that I've shared with kids, especially like do hard things. I've, um, I've, when he came out with that and I tried, cause I tried to point some of these kids they are kind of junior high to high school and did, you know, try to point them, Hey, this might be something you're interested in. So something like that, I think they could dive into a lot of kids, um, but you could definitely take some of those points out. He has like the four points of of how you know can approach doing hard things like being comfortable with the discomfort that kind of thing so those are ones i've read so some of them like sport gene or i don't know some of the uh, grounded some of those are particularly long and but they're they're all interesting kind of depends on the reading level of that kid. they're not necessarily oriented to kids right. but it depends on their their level but uh, they have some great stories like that one i had grounded um that is in stillness that some just great, great stories, great things in there. Peak I've mind. Athletes who, I've had some in the past who, when I would talk about, like, well, I want something to read. Give me, because they were readers and were always looking. And I like Steve Magnus's books, both of those, the peak, peak performance and the yeah, do hard things. Good. Great yeah. books. Really, really kind of, um, kind of like expl just explaining, you know, this is, these are the steps. Okay. Stepping out like that. So I like that about it. Very clear. Okay. Very good for anyone. Athletes anybody wanting to just perform at a high level really good yeah definitely i've always been a big fan of kind of the mental approach because that's kind of my was my forte i always kind of viewed myself as mentally more mentally tougher than my competition and that's the reason that i could separate myself or be myself in the room i'm kind of curious when you're standing on the sidelines or even watching the super bowl or the houston cougars or something like that mm -hmm. do you kind of try to get in their mind of what those high level athletes are doing. Yeah. You, <laughs> you hear, like what makes Tiger Woods great? Yeah. What is that one trait? What is what made mm -hmm. Michael Jordan great? Mm -hmm. You know, what made Tom Brady great? What makes Ryan Krauser great? Yeah. You know, is that is it 
do you have a sense that there's is this this they're so strong willed in their brain that they believe that they can go out in any situation and be successful? Uh, yes and no. I definitely find myself thinking that all the time, right? I'm obsessed okay. with entire March Madness. You're just like obsessed with watching these teams and how do you overcome and how do you come from people doubting your abilities? People say like confidence comes like when you're winning, but what about these people that, you know, had not and here they win or the winners end up losing. So, you know, what what um, affects that? That's that's definitely, I find myself thinking about it all the time. Is there some magic? I, what I also find myself thinking about is look at some of these high performers, like, I don't even want to mention names, but like, you know, Tiger Woods and some of these that, that have had struggled in their life, right? Yeah. Have really struggled to find balance. So I find myself more asking like, like you know, what, how, how are they kind of falling and then getting back up? Mm. I find that to be a really good question, right? Maybe they do great, but then they really fall rock bottom. And then if they're able to come back, like Tiger Woods was able to do, how do you do that? Right? How do you do that? And that takes a lot of grit. And okay, so that leads me, if if you have a young kid who's had some severe adversity, whether a major injury, they can't, they got a, they got hurt in a game and they got to sit out the rest of the season, they're redshirted, mm -hmm. or maybe lose a family member or, you know, something else happens. Mm -hmm. How, how do you kind of, in your role, walk them through that? And you, you don't have to go in great detail. I'm just kind of curious, kind of what your approach would be. I think that's a, such a good question because usually we're only thinking about in the moment, you know, yeah. it's so devastating. And of course you have to be, like you have to grieve whatever, you know, is going on, whatever you're losing at that moment. I think my, um, pardon me a second, the dog has to yeah, go, go ahead. Let her out real quick. Like your dog may want out. <laughs> All's good. <laughs> so um, I think that's a great question because, um, like I said, we only see that moment, but whenever you look at a lot of athletes that say have made the Olympics or some of these high levels, usually they'll have a story to tell about some difficulty that they went through. And they almost will say sometimes like, you've got to have something that you went through in order to really achieve these high levels. There's kind of a thought out there about, you hear that a lot, like you have to have gone through something. And so kind of being able to be in the moment and know that, yeah, like when you have a bad injury that you don't know if you're going to get to come back, if someone's just going to tell you, don't worry, it'll be okay, you're going to come back, that really would be a terrible approach. So you really got to allow someone to be in that moment and feel those feelings they have, and then take control of whatever they can at that moment, which might be rehab or might be um, dealing with family if there's an issue or, you know, some way just getting better and then allowing them to set their sights on something in the future, but to stay focused in the present moment. So I think a lot of that's really where you get to like being in the present moment and just being compassionate with yourself. So one approach I really follow is working with self-compassion. And that can seem kind of a weak term for it whenever you're thinking of sports. But I think it's that idea that um, it's so that sometimes I have to be my best friend. I have to be my most ardent supporter, especially in the tough times. I have to allow myself not to be perfect. And so to know, especially when you're in pain, you're in suffering in some way to remember that, yeah, this is, this really, can I say, like we say it, this sucks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this sucks. And no one needs to tell me anything else. And, and I know it's not going to be forever. Right. I know this is, this is what's happening now. And then can I just allow myself some kindness you know, like when my dog is scared when it's raining, you know, I'm, you're going to be kind to your dog. You're never going to like judge your dog for being scared of the rain, you know? So can you just give a little bit of that to yourself and just practice some of that kindness, which then doesn't make you weak. Instead, it allows you to kind of free yourself from all of this judgment. And now I can often move forward from there just because I practice a little kindness wow. to myself. That's awesome. Wow. You're pretty like good. You do to a friend. Yeah. I feel better about myself right now. <laughs> no, it's just, uh, it's just so great. And just a piece that athletes need. I think they, mm -hmm. they need this because of even more so than we did at our age, because we didn't have the social media. We didn't have to worry about performing. Yeah. I mean, I'd go watch the VHS tape of my game and I'd, otherwise mm -hmm. you didn't see it again. It wasn't replayed over and over and over and over and over. And exactly. Every mistake and everything you did. I mean, yeah. we, we send our kids the videos to analyze the good and the bad, but mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, it's just always there and playing and 
they need to learn how to navigate that and handle that. And yeah, really sometimes just allowing them say, <laughs> yeah, just allowing them to say, you know, yeah, that sucked. Like that was, I hated that. That was no fun. You know, just allowing you to verbalize kind of that feels bad. Then you're like, okay, yeah. What would you say to a friend if that's what they felt? That's a yeah. great thing to ask. What would you say to your friend if they felt like that? All right, now just say that to yourself. Okay, now what do we need to focus on, right? Now to how do we get started? What's the next step? Yeah. What do you need What's to do? What's the next step? I like that. How I, got do a, move forward? I got a very broad question, Ash, because um, because it's something that's popped up and I've always wondered if it was true and it's sitting here, sitting here talking. I was wondering if I'm going to ask, do you believe it is possible for someone to have what they call the yips? Like a <laughs> like a putter, who a, put, a golfer who always misses the putt or you know, a pitcher that all of a sudden can't throw in the strike zone or something like that. Mm -hmm. I, is that, I know it's not a true medical term, but is it, is it real? I guess. Like a mental block. I is it, is right. it? Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the research behind it is kind of, you know, documented these things um, of like, it's you, it's often follows some kind of stressful situation, some kind of stress someone's been under that, Sometimes it'll happen after, or, or an immense um, prolonged stress, like Simone Biles in the Olympics that said, you know, she was not able to, had the twisties, kind of similar kind of yeah. feeling is that um, kind of lost a, a kind of a connection to what seemed so automatic before. And it's often associated with some stress, some kind of stressful event or a prolonged stress. And so, and then, so it's really it has to be treated very individually, I think, but absolutely, I would say it's real. I think that's really the first thing because it, feel, it doesn't feel, it feels like you're crazy, um, I would imagine. So I think the first thing to do is be acknowledging like, yeah, this is real. This is your experience. And maybe you can't explain there's nothing physically wrong with you, but our body and our mind are tied together. So we have to acknowledge that this is how we're feeling right now. And we just got to start from there. It's like an injury. Yeah. So, yeah. Do you see where the body and mind are not tied <laughs> together? Is that, does it happen more commonly than you think? I guess it, when you're standing on the sidelines, can you, do you recognize it? Do you mean like, um, they're just not aware? Yeah. If, but you, but you, they're not aware, but maybe you see it kind of. Yeah. I think, I think, I think self-awareness is really the foundation upon which all like the sports psychology is built. Like being able to be aware of what am I thinking? It's kind of like being a little bit outside of yourself, right? An awareness of what goes on in my mind? Um, what happens whenever I get under stress? What happens whenever I'm feeling good and performing? You know, like what's happening in my body? What am I feeling right now? What is this sensation I'm feeling? So that's kind of a self-awareness. And that's kind of where that connection, I think, happens is whenever I just can kind of notice what I'm feeling and notice how that what I'm thinking affects the way I'm feeling and vice versa. So I think self-awareness is really the answer to that. Awesome. Awesome. So good. I know. So last question is tell, is yoga good for high school athletes? Uh, I, I would say, is it beneficial for high school athletes? Yeah, Absolutely. I, I'm very careful because I don't like to say anything is good or bad. And also, yeah. I don't know what kind of yoga this person is doing, who's teaching it. <laughs> well, because I, well, I just throw that out because in our weight training, I have a young lady who I've known for years that come over and does yoga for mm -hmm. us. And some of the kids are very like, I'm not doing yoga at all. Mm -hmm. And then when we kind of force them to do it, they discover they like it or they, they discover they're not very flexible and they <laughs> yeah, can't get right. into the, the the positions and all that type right. stuff. So. Right. So, so is it I helpful just wanted the for the expert to say it to say it was good? Yeah. Well, I think it's, it's helpful for definitely balancing the body, right? You often yeah. in a lot of um, sports, particularly in throwing, you're very imbalanced in the way you use the body. Yes. Right? So you've got these patterns on one side that not on the other. You you don't typically throw with both arms. So so doing something that's very different um, and uh, and is more uh, uses the entire body. Can be very helpful to help rebalance that right so that's really important and then something that moves slower so the benefits of yoga is if it, if it's the kind that will help you move slower it may help build some of that self-awareness so more awareness of how my how my body moves where i am in space and how i can you know control my body so that's helpful and then just having time to again to focus on the breath 
and kind of do more of that emotional, mental check-in and recognizing that, yeah, I can change the way I feel. I think that's the most powerful thing. Like, yeah, look at that. I was feeling this way when I started. And now I've been able to shift myself to feel this way. Hmm, that's interesting. How did I do that? That's that's the beauty, I think. Cool. Well answered, well answered. Yeah. So what's the future hold for you? Are you going to continue at, at, at University of uh, St. Thomas? Are you going to hopefully do more speaking engagements and work yeah. with a lot more sports teams? I, I love working with like a variety of sports teams. So I really hope to do more speaking engagements and, um, and, you know, continue to see clients individually and with teams. I really love getting out there and just getting to know um, all different kinds of people and athletes and, and sports and, you know, increase that knowledge. And then I love right now supporting the program at University of St. Thomas. And that's a, you know, part-time. So I do that and, um, and grow my business. So I think I just keep following that path because I, I love it. It's fun. I get to meet great people like you. Well, thank you. Now you work with uh, Rice University, their cross country as well. Is that right? Yeah. Yes, I do. I work with the, the women's cross country. Okay. And the UPSL men's soccer team revision. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And, and right now I'm working with Tompkins High School um, track and field out here in Katy as well. Oh, you really? And, yeah. So a lot of, a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Would yeah. you be, I'm sure like if, if, because, you know, coaches groups, they do a lot of training and stuff like that, just among the coaches, like on their, their days. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah. And, in service days. In, the, in service days and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Would you, is it, if we're just going to, I'm asking because people will listen. Would you be open to coming in to, you know, to some, speaking with some coaches, you know, football <laughs> coaches, girl, female coaches, anything like that is a large Definitely. group? Definitely. I think that'd be great. We could do it in person or virtually. I'll drive somewhere. Yeah. We can do it, you know, virtually. If it's like an online webinar or something, that works too. That's really awesome. fun to be in person as well. Then you can okay. do some activities together and, you know, really have some more interaction. Um, but absolutely. I, I, I really want to support coaches because, like I said, I know how hard that job is and um, and really need all you're expected to do way too many things. But anything I can do to help you be do that a little bit better. I'm all for that. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm still a teacher in the classroom, have been for 27 years. You know, the social emotional learning that we're, mm -hmm. you know, with the kids kind of, I don't want to say they're pushing it on us, but they are. And it mm -hmm. needs to be, you know, giving kids a time to check in daily and do all those mm -hmm. type of things. But we don't always do that for the coaches and the teachers, yes. you know, and things yeah. like that. So I know having coached in the school system forever, as I, I'm, I'm away from that now and just doing this coaching, but they tried, they try to start giving us those moments and those tools, but then the season starts and things get busy and oh, the hectic, yeah. so beneficial to have. You yeah, know, exactly. Someone like you for the coaches mm -hmm. in the middle of the season. Okay, come mm -hmm. in. Let's refocus on while we're here and all those things. Because so it it's, would be, it would be, yeah. it would be a great benefit. So yeah. If you're someone listening to this who coaches yeah. the big staff, reach out to her. She it would be, be great. Awesome. It would be great. Your mid season when you were crazy and having to teach class grade papers, yes. coach football teams, win championships, drive the bus, buy the, do the budget, break the field. All the things. Be a husband, yeah. wife, take yes. care of your mom and dad. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, totally. I think that would be a great idea. Right. We see a lot of kids who get burnt out or get they mm -hmm. stop throwing because of too much pressure. They don't know how to handle the pressure. Mm -hmm. um, and you're like, no, you're so good. You got to stick into this. But they mm -hmm. just, because throwing is so individualized. Yeah. And your success is really to what you do in the ring. Mm -hmm. And when you come from a team setting into an individual situation, the, it's a different dynamic. And some it's kids awesome. struggle with, mm -hmm. okay, I might have been part of a team and, you know, I might have went 0 for 4 in batting, but we still won versus I get six throws and they were real bad and I, I got fourth place. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So it is totally different, right? Sometimes that can be freeing if you think of it that way, right? Of being able to just focus on yourself. So it's, you're right. Sometimes it's a certain mindset that really by really likes that, and sometimes just kind of learning how to change the, your expectations. For and sure. it's so technical, like swinging a golf club. It is little mm -hmm. technical, intricate, it's, tiny little mm -hmm. movements that were different when you were on the on the yeah, offensive line. Yeah. And you see your results right away, right? Yeah. So it's yes. not like yeah. you, this yeah. is this is it. This is what you threw. No one can change it or hide it. Eight, eight seconds, I think I timed it one time. Once I start my throw, might be eight seconds. 
yeah. and something can mess up and then instantly it's like it's not right. like there's a second quarter or another half or a exactly you got yeah. this time and that's it that's and, it. And think about throwing too you mentioned earlier about feelings and stuff it is so much of a feel mm -hmm. that they feel mm -hmm. that when they get a good throw but on the opposite they feel it when they feel a bad throw mm -hmm. and, and and we from our perspective, I kind of do the 80, 20%. I, I, I tell them up front, what we do is probably going to be the 80% failure because you're not going to throw a PR every time mm -hmm. you're going to scratch. It's not going to feel right. Mm -hmm. So I kind of set that as big picture. So we're throwing for the 20% of that great feeling of that PR of winning that meet of, you know, having something happen that, you know, we can acknowledge and celebrate versus mm -hmm. the 80% of, oh my God, I'm tired of getting beat by this person. I'm tired of, you mm -hmm. know, it falling out of my hand. I'm foul. I'm tired of scratching and, you know, mm -hmm. and there's so many elements that's also out of the control of weather and a bad ring and a slippery ring and yeah. just other that stuff too, as well, that you don't know how to handle all that. So. Right. And I think that's a good point. And one thing I find with the with the throwing sports is it, there's so much about rhythm, right? It's, it's almost like this dance quality. It's very rhythmical. So it's really important in that aspect that you're really staying kind of zoned into your body and feeling and, and that you're not thinking it right. You really don't want to involve the brain once you're going into that. So you're trying to help them learn how to kind of stay in that feeling aspect, right? Of kind of loose and ready. What am I trying to feel? Can I trust that so that takes a lot of trust you just got to let go you can't if you, the minute you think about it the minute you tighten up yeah that's so, a great point trust, you need yeah. time, trust it trust yeah. it mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. and that's hard you know what does that mean so to trust yeah, exactly. that's a hard concept yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. it's mm -hmm. and we're doing it because we're brainstorming because we don't have anybody else to talk to uh, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's <laughs> well, well i just you know it. about oh. about the the the, the oh. mint about, <laughs> no about the mental aspect of it no hey, that was no no <laughs> yeah it's so funny we don't have anyone we need a we need a sports psychologist for our uh, yeah you're just a, talking to your rottweilers all the time yeah, we, yeah, <laughs> yeah so i told you that was the first question is how can she love me more <laughs> <laughs> just those little acts of kindness yes for sure for sure so <laughs> no i think i think this is great i really appreciate what y'all do because I, I mean i know what time it takes to put in a podcast i mean that's not easy so it's a lot that you've committed to and, you know, and it, it really is a service, you know, and I think what I'm in is the service industry and what you're doing is a service industry. Yeah. Like you're doing this for other people yeah. and, you know, and, you know, me too, it's got to be about the other people. Otherwise, it, if it's about you, then, you know, no one wants to listen to that. So yeah. exactly. it's got to be about them. So thank you. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. much. It's a competition always. And these, the good kids are usually multi-sport, you know, at some point. So, cause they're, they love it. They're good at everything and they love everything. Do you, and that's a great question. I got one final question. Do you find that multi-sport athletes, I don't want to say, have a better state of mind than a kid who maybe just puts all his egg in one basket? From a like young a age. Yeah, yeah, just a high school kid. I mean, I think, you know, there's there's definitely research backing up the idea of like, playing in a variety of things, right? It, that backs up that idea that number one, it builds us physically in a robust way, like being a good athlete, as opposed to necessarily being a good athlete in a sport, you know, is what really is important to their future success, just learning to be a good athlete, learning to develop yourself well-roundedly so that there, but there's some things like golf that tends to be better started young and kind of be you like, keep doing it. But for the most part, it's like being um, being just a good athlete and getting a variety of movement in your body up until the time maybe uh, beginning of high school or mid high school where you should, maybe it's better to start focusing for sure. And as far as more of a healthy mindset, having a little bit of better understanding of yourself as more than just one thing is healthier, right? So you know, I am more than just this right? I have other things I've been good at. That is usually healthier for a long-term perspective. Yeah. Oh sure. my, I just thought of another question. Oh, yeah. Is burnout real? Is, is a kid, <laughs> can a kid get burned out? I'm sorry. I got, never mind. Don't answer. No, no, of course not. 
just it is. It is. The feelings are real. And burnout has again a condition. You can mark it by certain characteristics. There's a oh gosh, I can't think of it. my mine went blank. It starts with an M. Um, but anyway, there's kind of a chart that kind of helps you gauge whether you're you know moving towards burnout. But it's more of a it's not like an illness that has a specific point, but it's just kind of a certain type. It's a description of a certain type of stress. That's different than say any stress you get from just being stressed out where you're like, ah, hair on end and everything. And burnout's more about almost close to depression in a sense, I would call it, where you're almost like you're not getting re-energized from like, so let's say to you get to take a break, you get an extra long spring break. Do you come back feeling energized or is it still like you find no joy in it anymore? So burnout's describing this idea that your battery is down and you, as, as opposed to just being stressed out which is over, you know, overly stressed, a little different. When you're three years away from retiring in the classroom, you yeah. not understand every yeah. <laughs> break. I'm not in like, yeah, I had a break. I'm like, yeah, hey, yes, yes. It's so, real. I gave a whole talk on that too, on burnout. So yes. oh, really? Stuff. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Sure. Well, if we have if stuff pop, pops up where we have more questions, <laughs> we're gonna have yeah. a second episode. So we'll have Definitely. part two. Definitely, we can talk about that. We can do it. We can do it on yoga mats. <laughs> Absolutely, even better on our backs. No, I'm just kidding. There you go. <laughs> well, you guys, thank you so really much. Have a great evening. Y'all have a great evening too. Thank you. Bye bye. We'd like to thank Michelle Gregovic for uh, being on for episode 94. What a what some great insight for understanding yeah. of her role as a sports psychologist consultant. What sports psychology is and kind of you know little ideas or suggestions on how to handle someone who's struggling whether it be the athlete where it could even be the coach or it could even possibly be the parent um the one thing that i'd really take home is kind of i asked her about the relax comment and you know she said instead of using the word relax and what does that mean be loose and ready be calm and clear um, be alive and on or ready for fi ready to fire. Uh, I think in the throwing world, that's those three, uh, what are they, verbiages, slang, cues, are could be very beneficial to teaching our kids is okay, we don't have to relax and just go out there and just kind of be a, you know, a goldfish or a octopus or jellyfish. 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 <laughs> Not jellyfish. jellyfish. But to be to be loose and ready to be calm, calm and clean, um, and so very good. And this this aspect of of the breathing and, and control of yourself, yeah. and how do you respond to stress cues in that slow breathing that she did, and then for the coach, establish a culture of, of whether it's a a, a, a big culture of a, a winning culture, yeah. of positive. A, positive, but also a safe safe place culture is where the kids want to come into and be a part of and i just i just loved everything about the, what she has to say her website again is uh, uh yeah it's a present moment the present the moment of mindset i love that because we need kids in any sport really that be in the present moment like don't worry about what happened before it's mm -hmm. it it trash you know it was good let it go because it's over don't think about ahead. Be present in the moment you are in. You know, that present moment mindset, the feel, all of the things. Yeah. And I like the red, red light, yellow light, green light mm -hmm. as well. She did just such a great job of how you can talk with kids about when we say relax, when we say focus, when we, they don't know what they mean, but if you say, okay, let's choose like a Jaguar. A Jaguar when they're ready, like we know what that looks like. They're ready to, you know, pounce, and, but they're focused, but they're not, you know, you can give them visuals of things they already know to connect to when we're trying to use words like relax and focus and, well, just do it. Just, you know, all these probably old school coaching words that, you know, they need a little bit better. So anyway, she was awesome. All right. We want to thank our sponsors for season six. Texas Track and Field Coaches Association. Go to ttfca.org for all the latest and greatest. Um, let's see, Texas Relays has already happened, so all those um, will probably be posted out there somewhere. State track meets coming up, all of that. So some of the best of the best in Texas. Um, 
you can look and see who those are and how they're doing. Um, fourthrows.com, um, use the code TALKINGTHROWS10 to get 10% off. Those guys will take care of you if you're looking for any implements. Um, port a circle, port a dash circle.com, use the code TALKINGTHROWS10. Um, you know, high school season is, I don't know, really coming to a close. We're coming to the pinnacle of the season. And then if you've got summer track and you won't have a school or a place to go, you need a quarter circle, right? You can throw you around. And um, if you're go ahead. if you're in Austin, go to Ready Up Athletic Development, readyupad.com, um, or contact Zach Phillips at 512-507-8347. Hello, Talking Throws, Texas podcasters. I'm Bruce Caldwell. I'm here today to introduce the Fiber Sport Discus. Yes, many of you thought I only made great vaulting poles. I have been bringing quality discuses to the thrower's hands for over 40 years. First as Cantabrian USA representative, then for the past 10 years as the Nelco discus distributor. I introduced the yellow plated discus for the plastic's dur- best durability. If your fiber sport discus breaks, we replace it. Our studies have reached into the science of using a wind tunnel and adding microchips to the discus to find the spin, the gravity, the flight stability of the discus. We have found it's not about rim weight anymore. It's more about creating a balanced stability to allow the discus to fly and surf the wind. Our new fiber sport discus is made to be selected to fit your needs, no matter the weather, no matter the conditions. Check out our discus selection guide at fibersportdiscus.com and find a dealer in your area that sells our fine product. Thank you, Jason Janelle, for allowing me to talk with your listeners on Talk and Throws Texas Style. And then also Lifting DFW, if you need programs, individual um, lessons for Olympic lifting or personal training lessons for mom and dad, whatever you need, uh, feel free to reach out to me. I can bring the mobile fitness station to your neighborhood, to your driveway, to your park, to your practice field, whatever you need. We can accommodate. Just go to the Lifting DFW website um, and you'll find my information there. Thank y'all so much. We'll see y'all down the road.